thanks for bearing with me there, everybody. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk today uh, about these practices that are all, I think, very related. Like, if you uh, kind of look at their origin story, I'm really glad that that talk by uh, Cameo kind of came first because, you know, she talked a little bit about the history of Agile and where some of these practices come from. And I'm going to talk a little about that too, but we're going to go about 3,000 years in the past when we talk about the history of some of these practices. So, uh, again, Justin Reock, Field CTO, Chief Evangelist at Gradle. Uh, I run a number of programs there, most recently have built our uh, advocacy team that I'm very proud of. Uh, we've got two Java champions on that team, uh, and I work for Hans Doctor directly, who is the inventor of the Gradle build tool. Who's familiar with Gradle as a build tool? Yeah, some of you? All right, great. How about Gradle Enterprise? Totally separate product. Cool, it's not a product pitch, we're not going to talk about it. I was just uh, curious. <clears throat> so yeah, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, you may have seen me do some other talks. I've done a bunch of DevOps days. I'll be doing uh, keynoting DevOps days Birmingham, Alabama this year. I was just at DevOps Days LA over the weekend and at the scale event. Um, so I love talking about this stuff and it's kind of what they pay me to do. So whenever we talk about DevOps and productivity, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with this quote. Uh, I think it's kind of the most relevant uh, to DevOps right now. And that is it's no longer the big beating the small, but the fast beating the slow. Right? And I think that was definitely a theme of the talk we just listened to. Time to market matters, speed matters, feedback cycles, having them quickly matter. Right? It's no longer the big behemoth companies that are winning, it's the small, agile companies that are able to bring their features to market quickly and respond to their customers' feedback and put in practice good, uh, good processes that promote productivity. Right? So let's talk about where some of this came from. Let's dig deep into the ancient business wisdom of the 70s and 80s. So many of you may be familiar with uh, this book, The Goal. Anybody? All right, yeah, nice. Okay, always in the DevOps crowds, there's, there's folks who, who, who know this book. Uh, Eli Goldratt, the author who wrote The Goal, was not really a business person, right? He was a physicist. And what was so interesting about the way that he thought about business was that he applied the laws of complex machinery and complex mechanics to the way that an organization works. And so when you hear things like bottlenecks, friction, throughput, value stream mapping, right? these are all sort of uh, key components to uh, Goldrot's work. Uh, and it really just focused on, um, again, clearing obstacles to throughput in your value stream. And we're going to go through that. Most famous work is the theory of constraints. Uh, it's helped uh, form the foundations of modern business productivity. This book is still like required reading in a lot of MBA programs and stuff. Very, very relevant information in here. And DevOps and Agile and Lean, you know, all of these processes can very clearly show part of their origin story rooted in Goldrot's work and in the theory of constraints. Uh, the theory focuses on treating organizations as a complex machine and eliminating bottlenecks to improve organizational efficiency. If you're not familiar with the goal, you're probably familiar with this. I've seen some copies of the Unicorn Project floating around. This book is its predecessor. Um, the book, the goal, was super interesting because it's not, like, it's not like a playbook, like the DevOps playbook I saw laying over here somewhere. It's not like that. It's a, it's a fictional narrative about a business that's struggling and a change agent that comes in and in the case of the Phoenix Project, uh, introduces uh, Agile and DevOps to, to change the organization. Right? And you kind of see this from a, from a narrative perspective. Right? And, and they are like, unashamed of the fact that they totally stole this format from the goal. Like The goal is the same way. It's a manufacturing company, fictional story about a struggling manufacturing company that's having difficulty maintaining their competitive edge. Change agent comes in, introduces at this point more like lean practices and lean manufacturing practices and saves the business. Right? So um, what I don't like hearing is that, oh, everybody's got these different definitions of DevOps, or nobody really knows what Dev where DevOps came from. And I mean, it's just not true, right? I mean, I think that people in this room, you know, if you've done your work, if you've looked at you know, where these practices have come from, you can see very clearly where Dev DevOps came from, and more importantly, where it's going, which is part of what we'll discuss as well. All right, what was the big change in philosophy with the theory of constraints? It was taking the idea of a business from a cost model to a throughput model. All right? What does that mean? All right? Well, it means that, for instance, layoffs were like the big band-aid that you would throw at a business. We're seeing that now, obviously, in the tech industry. 
But what the theory of constraints teaches us is that controlling cost doesn't really matter in the long run unless you're also able to either maintain or even increase your business's throughput while you're controlling that cost. All right, throughput is what matters. Now, how do you define these in a software business? It's pretty straightforward. Cost is organizational cost. This doesn't change. You know, you're paying your developers, you're buying your tools, you know, what your platforms, whatever it is. That's going to be a cost, right? Inventory is code in the case of this model, right? So in the, the original theory of constraints, inventory is what it sounds like, the raw materials that are manufactured to create a product that the business can sell, right? In, in, in our vernacular, this is code, right? The raw material is code that we convert into throughput, into money for the business, all right? The throughput of a business as a machine is money, right? That's its, that's its purpose, okay? And so the theory of constraints teaches us that inventory rots. Inventory is a cost. You have to manage that inventory while it's not creating money for the business. And the same is true with code. When that code is sitting around, hasn't gone through a PR yet, or we're security scanning it, or it's deprecated, that is rot, right? That is entropy at work, right? And it's keeping us from generating optimal throughput for the business. So the only initiatives that will positively impact performance are the ones which increase throughput while simultaneously decreasing cost. And right? if you take one thing away from this talk, I want it to be this. This is a universal rule. Any practice that you're going to put in your place in place for your business that will provably, not with assumptions, but will provably increase throughput and decrease cost will win every time. That's why these practices like agile and DevOps and platform engineering and what you'll hear about developer productivity engineering today, that's why they became so popular. They work, right? And it's the laws of physics that ensure they work. And most of the time, you can't break the laws of physics. So what did this turn into practically for us? It turned into this, right? The DevOps conveyor belt, the constant feedback loop. Always move forward. Don't, don't roll back code. Push, push fixes, right? Always move forward, right? Always be gathering feedback. Never stop. Never let your inventory rot. Constantly be dripping your code out to production to make money for the business. Another version of this with some actual technologies behind it. But I mean, we see there's just a, a galaxy of tech that's really sprung up around this. Um, but for all of that, and all of that sort of tyranny of choice, if you will, there are really just a few DevOps technical actions that, that I think really matter, right? The first is to choose supported free software and an open first policy without deployment or accessibility constraints. Now, before this job, it was my job to go around and tell enterprises to do this. And I loved doing that. It was great. It was really redeeming to be able to go in and convince a business to ditch $20 million worth of Oracle technology and replace it with something open source. Right? Very fulfilling. Uh, but it became redundant. We won. Open source is here. It's here to stay. It's eating the world. So we got to the point where I would go around and give these talks and people were like, yeah, thanks, we know. We've been doing that for like two years. So, uh, so we all have to move forward, right? So what else? Deploy, whoops, deploy in cloud or container substrates with choreography, all right? So choose open first software so that you're not constrained by procurement, licenses, all that kind of stuff. Deploy in cloud or a container substrate, something ephemeral. Uh, so that you can always be deploying and always be monitoring. Uh, decide on a viable and relevant API management solution and build a fail fast culture, right? This one, so many businesses are still failing to do this, no pun intended, but really you have to get into a position to not only expect failure, but even build your systems around the fact that things are gonna fail more often than they're gonna succeed and that that's okay. Right, that's, that's just an essential part of engineering. All right, so speaking of free software, why free software for productivity? Uh, well, because there's a lot of problems with closed development. Um, difficulty of slowness in obtaining software and media, just actually getting your hands on the software. An inflexibility in terms of being able to grow and scale when you have to you know, assume additional license costs as you build out your infrastructure. Uh, no ability to modify feature sets. If you're lucky and you're dealing with a good vendor, you might have a vendor who cares about feedback and, and will push some of their product direction based on, on your advice, but there's no guarantee. Uh, inability to learn from and improve on others' work, less competitive risks are outweighed by growth of the community and open source knowledge. 
This is another one where, especially companies that have a lot of protected IP, uh, really have some opportunities for improvement here. I see a lot of folks say, well, I would love for our developers to contribute to an open source project. But if we do that and we improve it, and one of our competitors is using that software, well, didn't we just do all this work to give them a competitive edge? Yeah, maybe, but you learned a ton in the process. right? You learned a ton of domain knowledge about the product. You're involved in the community. right? You just can't do that uh, with, uh, with something closed source. And then obviously, less oversight by additional parties leads to less security on the whole. This is provable. Study was done uh, by the, uh, well, it's now the Linux Foundation, uh, OpenSSF where they looked through all the vulnerabilities in the NAIST vulnerability database, guess what? Higher percentage of vulnerabilities in there for commercial software than for open source, which was weird because open source is more visible. But the thing is that those, those, those vulnerabilities are dealt with more quickly uh, in an open source community. All right, so I said we're gonna go back in, in history. Open source versus closed source was not the beginning of this problem. Some of you might be familiar with the work of alchemists. Right? Now, alchemists, uh, they don't get a lot of credit for the few contributions that they made to science because they did everything in secret. All right? And they didn't share what they were doing with other alchemists. So a lot of them would like drink mercury and lead, trying to like, live forever, and of course that didn't work. But they weren't able to share those notes with other alchemists. Right? So it's a dilemma. Right? How do they know that they're doing the right thing? And how does anybody know what they're doing if everything's being done closed and, and in secret? Go back a little further in history. Some of you might be familiar with uh, Pythagoras, this guy. Or at least you may be familiar with uh, the Pythagorean theorem, a uh, way to calculate the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Pythagoras was an interesting, interesting guy. Uh, put yourself back in Crotone, southern Italy, uh, a couple thousand years BC. And uh, at the time, the whole infrastructure is built using geometry, which was considered sacred, right? It's still sometimes called esoteric or sacred knowledge when you, when you, when you, when you think about like old secret societies and what they did with geometry. Pythagoras believed it was a language of, of nature, and more importantly, everyone thought that what he was doing was magic almost, right? Because it was capable of building roads and cities and, and, and running water and all these things that were so important. Well, the big problem with Pythagoras was that he had a school in Croton that he split into two sections. Now the inner circle of the school, or the mathematicae, were the only ones that were actually allowed to learn uh, geometry. Uh, and Pythagoras would decide who got to go in the school and who didn't, sort of arbitrarily. It didn't really have a process for it. And then you had your outer circle of the school called the acousmatics, the listeners, but really they were more like servants for the school, running around, running chores and things like that. So he's doing all this work in secret, He's got this closed school. The work that they're doing is building all the infrastructure around them, which should sound a little bit familiar to those who manage or write code, right? It's esoteric. Not everybody understands it. But at least it's not really being done so much in secret anymore. Well, along came this guy, Cylon, noble person in Croton, believed uh, that he really should be part of this uh, school of the, the mathematical. He was a noble person. You know, back then you also had this belief that you could be born with a certain divine right or a, or a nobility. And uh, Cylon thought that it was his divine right to be part of this inner circle. Pythagoras disagreed. Uh, but he did consider it kind of his birthright. So when Pythagoras uh, refused these requests, he revolted against the, uh, the school. And uh, uh, many of the students were killed in the revolt, and Pythagoras ended up dying in, uh, in exile. All right. Now, that's a little bit more extreme of an example that uh, we might run into with closed source, but you get the point, right? Secrets are not great, and people don't like it when you're keeping secrets, especially when they know that these secrets are very, very important, right? So that's part, been part of the importance of openness, but kind of luckily, we, we keep navigating through history, you know, kind of move through this idea of birthright, and nobility, uh, and then this interesting thing would happen. Uh, we would enter into this time called the Age of Enlightenment, right? It's often uh, summed up by this quote by Immanuel Kant. Dare to know, have courage to use your own reason, all right? This was a profound statement at the time. It was the nobility that were setting the rules and telling everybody how things were supposed to be. So for Immanuel Kant to come along and say, hey, no, use your own brain. 
Don't trust what the nobility is telling you. Rely on yourself, right? This was revolutionary, and it led to all types of different ways of thinking, like Sir Francis Bacon, who made everything better with the publication of the Novum Organum, or was a new philosophy called reductionism. And guess what? It championed the individual, right? It said break problems down to their individual parts because individuals matter. So some of these principles that stemmed from enlightenment thinking are just second nature for those of us who have been around open software communities before, right? These are just our values. This is just what we try to bring to the world. Sharing of ideas through publication, the rise of the public sphere or the public domain, uh, individual liberty, creative freedom, scientific method and reductionism. This was another very important uh, move that was made towards engineering and openness. Sir Isaac Newton published Principia Mathematica, which was a collection of all of his discoveries, formulas, and for the first time, a prominent thinker like Newton was able to get his ideas out for free to other thinkers. And this led to a surge in, in, in innovation and, and engineering at the time. It would uh, give rise to the idea of the Florentine bodega. So these open communities working together, philosophers, scientists, artists, sculptors, playwrights. Leonardo da Vinci was discovered in a Florentine uh, bodega. Right? But these are these open public spheres for thought. The Parisian Salon, where the, uh, the affluent would get together and talk about the problems of their time, again, in this public forum where we could all weigh in, where it wasn't the nobility telling us what we needed to do, but rather individuals making decisions themselves and working together. Right? That's exactly the spirit of openness that we embrace in open communities. But then this happened. <laughs> all that openness was great. And then it just exploded. Fragmentation, 15 different solutions for everything, right? And this is just cloud technology. If you haven't seen this diagram, this is the Cloud Native Compute Foundation's uh, landscape. It's growing every day. There's so much software on here. <clears throat> Luckily, uh, the CNCF has provided what I, I like, this very nice trail guide to going cloud native. I, I really like what they've done here. They're, they're able to say, OK, you've got all this, but but we can kind of prescribe you this, this one path to, to, to doing modern DevOps. So how's this changed software? <sighs> Considerably. Uh, some of you um, looking around probably came up you know, in software around the same time that I did in the, in the mid-aughts, or excuse me, the mid-90s and the early aughts. Um, and back then, we would do this thing where you would buy a server from Dell for like 10,000 bucks. You stick one app on it, you know, utilize like 2% of the thing's resources, and you stick it in a data center, and that was how things had to be done. Because they figured out if they tried to put multiple business apps on the same server, well, they would clobber each other, starve resources. So, so this was bad. Um, and we know that then virtualization kind of came out of this. That was a very expensive setup. Uh, stuff really, truly running at like 2 or 3% capacity back then. I mean, it was bad. Um, individual apps could unfairly utilize server resources, library conflicts, like we know all this stuff. Very disorganized. In the end, the important thing here is that for all businesses still, back then and to this day, only, people only care about the app, right? I mean, it's, uh, as, 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 as folks who work around DevOps and people who appreciate the infrastructure part of the work, that may be a hard pill to swallow, but the truth is the business doesn't care about Kubernetes, they don't care about what version of Kubernetes, they don't care about your service mesh, they don't care about any of that. They want the app to be up, right? And that's what this has always been about, keeping the app up. So machine virtualization, we don't need to go into a huge discussion. I'm sure most of you are familiar. Um, but of course, you know, this was a great step because we could then you know, take um, the app and slice it and put it on an individual virtual machine so then our machine, our one big expensive server could host more applications, right? This is a, this is a big deal, right? It changed the way we did things. VMware rocketed as a, as a result of this. Suddenly we were utilizing more like 85, 90% of our resources. We are still wasting stuff here at this layer. Too many operating systems had to be installed on these virtual machines, and so we created containers, right? Um, and this is, where, this is where you need to be. Um, you know, when they first, when Docker kind of first reared its head and Kubernetes came out, there were a lot of very compelling arguments. We don't need this. We're not Google. You know, we don't need to deploy stuff this way. But it isn't really about doing things the way that Google does things. It's about doing things in a way that's more organized, repeatable, 
uh, disposable, and ultimately reliable, right? And can, can take advantage of a lot more automation. Uh, so if you don't have a plan to containerize, like, I don't know what you're doing here, leave and go figure it out, because you, you're, you're, that will be critical to your business's relevance over the next five years. And all of this has created a need for an ecosystem. And that ecosystem seems to be Kubernetes. <laughs> so, you know, we saw that huge uh, explosion of software on the CNCF. Um, now we have the, a way to take these containers and put automation around them uh, in a way that's declarative and ephemeral and meets the, 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 the needs that, that we have when we try to deploy this way. Uh, you can deploy your applications quickly, scale your applications on the fly, roll out new features and optimize the use of hardware. I don't think anybody in this room probably needs a lecture on Kubernetes. Just want to point out that that has really influenced the way that we write software. Who's familiar with the 12-factor application? All right. Oh, lots of people. That's great. I usually don't get that many. Um, fantastic. Well, so when you're writing software for a VM and it's monolithic and it's going to be on all the time, and you can rely on static resources and things like that to be available, you can write your code in a way that, that meets kind of those, I would say, sort of lack of constraints. When you're in an environment where you literally have no idea where your code might be running next, and spin up a microservice in, in Argentina or something like that to serve a, you know, a, a data need and then spin it down five seconds later, right? your software can no longer rely on resources being always available and even the software always being up. So the 12 factors were put together to really give us, uh, I say, some rails to lead to a more portable and cloud-native and cloud-friendly design, right? I don't want to imply that if you're not doing 12-factor that your cloud effort will fail. That's not really true. But what will happen is that there's an indirect relationship between the amount of friction that you experience doing that deployment and dealing with that software and the amount of 12-factorness that you've put into that software. It's inversely proportionate. The more 12-factory, the less friction you'll experience going to cloud, period. So I really would suggest that you take a look at all of these and just be honest, do a self-assessment about you know, where your application is in relation to sort of the platonic ideal of meeting all 12 of these factors. And it gives you a nice rubric you know, to understand the cloud maturity of your product. And it also gives you some rails to understand what steps you can take to kind of improve things even further. Uh, so, so interesting. So openness, freedom, uh, championing of the individual, uh, a focus on speed, productivity, removing bottlenecks. Um, that's brought us here. But what, what comes next, right? It's not a question that I see asked often enough. But what came after Agile, right? With SRE, and then what came after SRE was DevOps. Now we're seeing this interesting mid-step with platform engineering. Any platform engineers in the house? All right, a few of you, nice. Seeing an interesting um, evolution where if you look at companies who have been really, really good about productivity and developer productivity in particular, companies like Netflix, Uber, LinkedIn, Twitter, Square, they took this step where they had like CI or DevOps engineers, platform engineers, and then they grew those platform engineers into what they're calling productivity engineers, right? or developer productivity engineers. And developer productivity engineering is this emerging practice uh, that we're seeing come after platform engineering for a lot of the companies who really take a productivity first mindset. But the good thing about developer productivity engineering is that in every case, it decreases cost and increases throughput no matter the size of your organization. And so it's really for everybody. You know, it's the Bay Area tech companies that heard about it first and started putting it in play. But you're going to see a lot about this. Um, and it's very timely. Uh, I like to read Gartner reports and surveys and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> I like reading the, C the uh, annual CEO survey. It gives me an idea. You know, what are people caring about? What can I latch on to? And uh, 2020, developer experience was listed as a single digit concern for CEOs. Less than 10% of CEOs said that they had any mindfulness around developer experience or that it was a concern for them. Fast forward to 2022, over 70%. It's been a surge just in the last couple of years of C-suite concern for developer experience, right? So I think there are legitimate reasons to say that where we are headed is towards developer productivity engineering. Now, 
With developer productivity engineering, there's a very important relationship between joy, developer joy, and developer productivity. And that relationship is that they're exactly the same thing, right? Happy developers are productive developers, and they write the best code. So you take yourself back to learning to code, kind of where these kids are right now, that ecstasy, that kind of creative flow that comes with doing this very creative and scientific simultaneously activity, right? On the one hand, you're, you're visualizing your problem and you're creating a solution for it. But on the other hand, you're creating a dialogue, a hypothesis with your tool chain. You're saying, if I write this code and build it, is it going to do what I want it to do? Or are you going to give me the feedback that I need that I did the right thing? And that feels good, right? That's the little dopamine hit that we get that moves us into the next feedback cycle. And cycle after cycle after cycle effectively is developer experience, OK? So these kids, they just route system.out.println, hello world. Sorry if you don't like Java. <laughs> but they ran that, and they, or maybe, uh, maybe just uh, print, printlin at hello world if you like Kotlin now, I guess. Um, they ran that, pops up on the screen, yay, ecstasy, wow, we did it, joy, we win. I want you to imagine for a minute that these kids were waiting 45 seconds, a minute, 10 minutes, an hour, 20 hours in some of the most extreme cases that we've seen to get that feedback. They're not going to look like this, right? They're going to look like that, and they're going to go find another hobby. But why do we do this to our developers? We do this, we do this right now. It's 2023. We st I mean, Netflix even, we just helped them fix a cycle time that was an over, over an hour for a back-end Java app. Why is this acceptable? <laughs> it shouldn't be, right? DevOps has helped us a lot, clearing the bottlenecks uh, to, and then friction to productivity on the right side of the continuum. But it has not paid enough attention to the left side. It's not paid enough attention to developer experience. That's why we need developer productivity engineering. I'm going to ask a question that shouldn't be provocative, but it is. <laughs> How many of you are tracking local build times? The time it takes for a developer to wait on their laptop, not in CI, be careful, on their laptop for a build to complete? One. I see maybe two more hands back there. That's OK, don't feel bad. Crickets always follows this question. But why? <laughs> it's one of the most important metrics for understanding developer experience. How long are they waiting for feedback so that they can stay in a state of creative flow and developer joy and ultimately productivity? So if you take two things from this, one, cost and throughput, that thing. The other thing is this. Start tracking this data. It's not hard to get. Any of your build tool has the ability to export this data and put it into a Prometheus, Grafana, whatever. Just take a look at it. You will be shocked at what your developers are putting up with. Um, Danny Thomas, who is the developer productivity engineer at Netflix, uh, who we worked with to, to get that back end up down uh, from like an hour down to like under four minutes or something. Uh, I was interviewing him for one of our podcasts, and he said, it is staggering the amount of toil and friction and frustration that engineers are willing to put up with. <laughs> and it's true. But we don't have to, right? We can make this better, but we need to start by measuring it. But this is why, when we say quite literally, developer productivity engineering is the next thing after DevOps, because it's the next set of bottlenecks to clear, right? If we're talking about a value stream, and we're talking about where the primary bottlenecks are, once you've implemented automated release, once you've implemented strong DevOps practices, once you've implemented platform, then where are the bottlenecks? Primary bottlenecks right there in the developer's local experience and what they're experiencing in CI. So when we say DPE is the next big thing after DevOps, we mean that very literally. This is the next set of bottlenecks to clear to keep developers productive and happy and to keep our competitive edge. What is it for all that talk? It really just takes an engineering approach to productivity an engineering approach to productivity. So instead of like leaning on people and, and trying to chase people problems, DPE chases technology problems. How do we improve feedback cycle times? How do we make builds faster? How do we make tests less flaky? Oh, that's a big one, right? How do we deal with, with, with flaky tests? How do we make sure that avoidable failures that waste developers' time are removed from our process of, of, of creating software, right? So with DPE, that's the big critical difference between productivity management and productivity engineering. We are clearing bottlenecks for developers to keep them happier and keep them in a state of flow more often. So real quick, in terms of what problems it solves, we talked about feedback cycle. If you can imagine this is a developer, and this developer is you know, maybe their local environment or even a remote workstation or in CI, 
And these are effectively feedback cycles. That's what those are, all right? And sometimes things are fine. Sometimes they're too slow, right? Feedback cycles just take too long. So let's address that. Sometimes they take too long to fix, okay? Just because a build breaks or goes red doesn't mean that a developer is going to get pulled immediately out of their state of creative flow. Just another problem to solve. Great, we love solving problems. If 45 minutes later, we're still trying to hunt down the build engineer, or we're trying to scrape data from some console log that we can't get to, or pull data from some ephemeral Kubernetes pod that destroyed itself like 10 minutes ago, we are not happy at that point. <laughs> we are experiencing undue toil and, and frustration. So we want to eliminate, uh, we, want to, we want to help developers solve these, challenge, uh, solve these problems faster. Right? And then finally, could have been eliminated altogether if we've just been observing it. Flaky tests and avoidable failures. Another great metric to start capturing is failure rates across all builds. So a lot of people are tracking failures in CI, which is pretty good, but you need to combine that data with the local failures that your developers are experiencing as well. Aggregate those up, put them on a dashboard so you can say, this one, getting feedback, this one failure has impacted 30 developers over the last week. Maybe we should do something about that instead of just anecdotally listening to the loudest developer, the developer that complains the most. If you've got an hour to improve your tool chain, where do you spend your time? Without that data, who knows, right? But if you have data about failure rates, test flakiness, you know exactly where you should spend that hour. I'm not gonna go through this, this is a quagmire. Uh, you're welcome to look at this in the deck. Just note that the problems that we're, uh, we're, we're addressing are these things at the top. Wait time, context switching, which we found out, by the way, that we're not only incapable of context switching and multitasking, but really compelling research over the last couple of years has shown that content, constant context switching leads to a, a buildup of glutamate in the prefrontal cortex of the brain that directly leads to cognitive fatigue, right? So we're trying to eliminate that. Uh, flaky tests, avoidable failures, no metrics, no KPI observability, have no clue what our developers are experiencing in their local workstations. And then inefficient use of CI. It's not so much about productivity, but avoiding work here is going to make CI more efficient. If builds are faster, agents won't be tied up as long. What happens when developers run into a flaky test? Oh, failed, oh, failed, run it again. Oh, failed, run it again, run it again, run it again. Green, went green, good, done. That's like five, six you know, builds that didn't have to run in the first place, and you're probably introducing a bug, so double fail. All right, that's pretty much what I've got. If you like this, uh, if this is compelling, we have a ton of free information available for you uh, at our website. We've got interviews with um, some of the folks that I mentioned. In fact, you'll see the Netflix interview uh, with Danny Thomas up on that page. Um, a, a lot of information uh, to kind of get you going here. Uh, I'm also kind of always available uh, to hop on a Zoom or whatever. I love talking about this stuff. And the nice thing about being kind of in the field CTO and advocacy office is that I don't roll up to sales and I don't roll up to marketing. All I have to do is talk about this wonderful practice. So, uh, so feel free to reach out if you want to learn more about it or go to our learning center. Uh, there's a book for this. It's in uh, revision two. Um, right now an ebook, but we are working uh, to get this thing uh, physical. Uh, you'll see Gradle's logo here in the front. That's it. You will not see Gradle's logo for the rest of the whole book. It's very much a vendorless and, and vendor agnostic uh, bit of material to take a look at. And it'll explain to you in 81 pages in a lot more detail everything that I've kind of gone through here. And that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. Do we have time for questions or where are we? Um, we are right at time. Okay, so no problem. Come find me after. Maybe one question. Does, do we have questions? Let's see hands if we have questions. How many do we have? Ooh, we do have lots, so I'll be around, let's though. let's take a little bit of time for questions because I don't want you all to be. I we can we can flex things just a little bit. Yeah, Trent, uh, we're good. We're good. I mean, we're we got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're risking your lunch time, but ask questions. Right. Just kidding. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Aiden. If you're a if you're a TI. TDD shop and you're doing your metrics of build on the local machine as you're developing, you're writing your tests first, how's that going to skew your metrics to, to the fine, you know, what you check in and that's run in, in CI with those tests? That's where you really want to provide um, some metadata around that. So you'd want to be able, like for instance, uh, the way that we do it, we tag all the, 
we run these things called build scans. Anytime a build runs, it takes a whole bunch of forensic data from the build tool and injects it into an analytics platform. And when it does that, we use special tagging to say like, okay, this was for this project, this was a CI build or a local build, right? Uh, this, this was built against whatever JDK 17. And then we can filter that data down to just those specific small sets of workloads. So, good question. What's your definition of platform engineering? Oh, great question. Um, so in my mind, uh, platform engineering is effectively the folks who can treat the developer tool chain and platform almost as a service that they maintain for developers. And it's part of that job to not only provide the platform, but also optimize the platform. So uh, platform engineers tend to love DPE because they, you can just include some of this stuff like the build caching and the metrics gathering and stuff as like a plug into your build and just make it part of the platform. I have a question. If you're oh, back here, um, if you're on the platform team or you're in DevOps and you do care about the build and, and, and test times, but you're not the one writing the you know Java code and the developers are the ones that are really responsible for how long it takes to build or, or how many tests are being run, uh, how can we influence that as platform engineers? It's a great question. Um, you have to think about the value proposition from both perspectives, right? On the one hand, the developers are experiencing better feedback cycle times and less, less frustration and toil, which is great. But as somebody who's working on either the platform or the CI side, you're getting less tickets, right? Your ticket bandwidth is gonna go down because some of this stuff involves self-service troubleshooting for developers, and some of it means agents running faster, and some of it means just you know, less builds being run overall, or at least builds being built in a more reliable way. So what I would actually say is, in your case, don't worry so much about the developer value proposition, like that will pay off. Think about how it's gonna help your team, because then it can be really influential if you're able to say, okay, well, if we're able to reduce our ticket load by 30%, you know, what does that return to us? And a lot of times you can justify it just based on that. Last question. I've, I've got Mike over here. Um, ah. Right here. I'm, I'm blind. Oh, thank you. Hi. <laughs> Um, and this is a quick question, and I can probably come find you afterwards. Sure. Do you actual do you have studies or references for the context switching? Pre you yes. The prefrontal um, cortex. Could I get those from you? Not yes. I have a study that was done not long ago by the Mayo Clinic uh, that was referenced actually by uh, my boss during his keynote for our own productivity engineering summit. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I will find it. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Great Justin. Questions.